Hello, amazing people. Welcome to another episode of one on one interviews. Today, seventh episode and uh, for the second time, uh, I am very, very grateful uh, to host another Spanish strength and conditioning coach after Chisco Sanz, our big friend. Uh, I have uh, privilege to talk with Dani Moreno. Dani, uh, thanks for coming. Thank you, Luca, for hosting me. Perfect. Uh, Dani Moreno is a strength and conditioning coach of Joventut Badalona. For all of you who are not familiar with uh, European or Spanish basketball, Joventut Badalona is one of the uh, most famous teams in, in Spain. And in early 90s, uh, this club was one of the best uh, in Europe, especially between 1991 until 1995. Uh, they won several championships and ever since they have been playing uh, at the top of European basketball. Uh, a little bit of ups and downs in the last 15 years, but uh, in the last five years, club is again becoming very, very stable. And this season they are playing very good. So I hope uh, that uh, bright future is, is coming and Euro Cup and Euro League uh, years are yet to come, you know. Uh, I would really like to see Joventut Badalona because I, I, I really respect the club for, for its history and I think we have to mention several facts uh, before we start the interview about Joventut Badalona. Uh, this club is a very traditional club and as I said, they have like huge, huge uh, history based on uh, winning titles. Uh, Joventut Badalona is also known because uh, they play in the capital of basketball, as you like to call uh, Badalona. And I also want to say that uh, they play in the arena which hosted a uh, basketball tournament of uh, Olympic Games Olympic in 1992. Games in 1992 yeah. It's incredible big uh, arena. A little bit old now, but still I, I like to be there. I like when we... When the we dream team play there, so... Dream team and Croatia. Croatia, and Croatia yes, great game was, also. Yeah, for, for Croats, it's like a very, very important uh, place. So uh, don't, don't forget the 1992 Olympic Games. It was many years ago, but uh, that's the that's a su success that we have, you know. So, un unfortunately, in the last 15, 20 years, we haven't done anything very uh, good on the world scene, Olympic scene. So we always come back to 1992. So it's pretty normal for us. But also, I wanted to say that uh, Joventut Badalona is uh, also very famous in Europe because I would uh, dare to say that they have one of the best, if not the best, youth development systems in Europe and every couple of years uh, young players become very very good players in Spanish leagues uh, they go to other teams to play and uh, a lot of uh, youth national teams play in Badalona and it's it's definitely one of the best places to to grow up as a as a basketball player so these are the facts about Ho Joventut Badalona that you need to know, uh, especially because I respect the club very much. And now we're going to talk, of course, about uh, Dani, about Dani's uh, past, about uh, Dani's present and future. Uh, so, uh, as I said, uh, Dani is currently working with Joventut Badalona and he has been with the team for the last 10 years as a professional, but last 20 years as a guy who worked in, in the club first 10 years with youth teams and not as a professional and then last 10 years uh, as a professional. So you can imagine what is behind the professional career of a 20 year old strength and conditioning coach, especially in Spain where uh, people support scientific research and practical knowledge. And Dan is one of the guys who really respects science. Last year at the conference of uh, Spanish strength and conditioning coaches in Barcelona, which we had at the end of the season, I had privilege to watch and listen to Dani's presentation. And I really like how he put things together uh, that come from practical experience and also his scientific background. So I'm really, really looking forward to interview uh, Dani today. And I know that for sure I'm going to go home with a couple of ideas in my head for practical work. So um, I would like to start uh, by asking you uh, one question. Uh, it's more that you tell us 
a little bit about your background and of course I would like to hear about why and how do you become a strength and conditioning coach. Well, did, that's easy question, long, long, long to, to answer but easy question. Um, I was raised in Badalona, so basketball city and um, all I knew uh, when I was young was basketball. So to be close to basketball, attached to basketball, that's easy. Um, then when I start to think about the study um, around the sports or about the, the, the sports, um, I want to be at the beginning strength and conditioning coach. I don't know why, but I love to, to the knowledge, the scientific knowledge behind our work. No? Uh, but then I start uh, in the college, my first years, and I become more a, a coach. I become more a coach. I also play at the time, so I become more the tactical stuff, technical stuff. And, and um, then step by step, I finished my, my studies. I went to Madrid to study in the Spanish Olympic Committee, as Chisco did. Uh, <laughs> I watched the interview. And, um, and I started with Juventud. As soon as I finished my, my degree, I, I started with Juventud. And then I was coaching in one club and then starting with Juventud doing strength and conditioning coach. And uh, I really loved it. I really loved it and I really love uh, work with that level of players. Now there's a big difference to work with amateur or semi-professional players to work with uh, the top players. No? I had, I don't know at the time, uh, a 12 years old Ricky Rubio and work with this kind of talents is amazing. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. And mm, I'm here. <laughs> no, uh, at the beginning, I also uh, want to do my PhD to answer some questions I had in mind. And um, this helped me a lot to um, look to the sports from another perspective, no? Uh, in the basketball, in Spanish basketball, in European basketball, but also in Juventud, we have like a empirical or a experienced way to look to sports, no? Uh, and on the other side, I get a very good scientific background to, or oh, that helped me to, uh, approach to sports in another way and uh, I think this helped me to make a good mix along the, the way and finally I, I became professional, I could, I could be professional in, in, in the university or, or being professional in basketball I decided to, to, to stay in basketball. Uh, I thought I was young at the time and and that was a good opportunity and, and was my dream that came true and, and that's all. Perfect. Uh, you mentioned that you did your PhD and that was definitely one of my uh, topics or questions, however you want to call it. So when you mention it, let's talk uh, immediately about, about your PhD project. Uh, what was the topic? Why did you choose it? Can you tell us a little bit yeah. more about it? Um, my topic my, my first idea was general. No? I was studying to improve basketball players. I, was, uh, I want to know um, how strong they were, how much they run uh, during the games, how, how many times they jump or whatever. Everything they do just to know where I have to uh, bring the players no? mm -hmm. from zero to, uh, to performers. No? And, um, and my question was everything I read or everything I learn, this comes from what they become playing basketball or this comes from what they become training. So what I mean is a uh, 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 VO2 of a basketball players comes specifically from the, their work on the court or it just they have a, a strength and conditioning coach that make them run and they show a great value of VO2 uh, to max or whatever, whatever you measure, uh, strength or whatever, power or, or anything else. And I start 
with this. And I start with um, VO2 and fatigue in basketball because I was close to that kind of research at the moment. Mm -hmm. So uh, my project was to know how um, a basketball player get fatigue from a cardiovascular point of view mm -hmm. during a game. So I did two things, but I get many, many, many values of uh, these two things, but I, I did just basically two things. Make them play with an oxygen uptake uh, device, uh, uh, K4, and... Portable, and right? Portable, yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. <laughs> but it's... <laughs> Not a car. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's very hard, like, it's, it's, it's still, like, so unusual for people to talk about it, like... No, 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 it's... it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's just to be clear, because... See, see, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> The K4 was the, the second uh, Cosmet apparatus to, to, to study that and was very nice because it was the first that analyzed um, oxygen and, um, and dioxide of, uh, and carbon dioxide. And, um, and then I make a test. I choose the, the Cours Navet, uh, the BIP test, mm -hmm. the 20 meters shuttle run test, and I compare them. But, and, and during the games, sorry, sorry for inter interrupting, just no, to no. give people a little bit more information because for me it's something unusual. Uh, in Croatia we didn't have this kind of equipment, so I want to be clear and I, wanna, I want people, by listening to us, I want them to visualize a little bit how it looks like. So they are wearing uh, some yeah. kind of like a backpack, yeah. which is portable device. A backpack and with a mask, all the cables are around, <laughs> attached. As and best as we can. Did you have uh, many players using at the same time, or you no, chose no, no. one by one? Just one. This, one. this it was, was like a case study. Yeah. This was at, at the end of the process because at the beginning I didn't think much about it. But at the end of the process is what uh, is one of my favorite points to highlight when I talk about my PhD project is that I had five players, five players, four or five players more on the bench with each team. So let's say 20 players, with coaches, with one camera, one assistant uh, to me. I was uh, controlling everything, referees, and one guy on the, on the table uh, with the scoreboard. Mm -hmm. So let's say 30 people, just to take one value. 10 minutes on one value. We play one quarter, and when I'm th even now when I think about it, it's in 30, 40 minutes, I just take one value <laughs> with a lot of people involved in my craziness because after that you get knowledge for sure but for you is oh, uh, uh, this guy is playing uh, between uh, anaerobic uh, threshold or uh, above or whatever or in the and that metabolic zone and it's value only for uh, one guy yeah, but for, for everybody else is okay so what <laughs> how how many match I, I'm going to score because of that or because of it's, it's that, that, that was crazy, that was crazy. And I had um, a nice sample of 30 players, all of them great players, uh, the most of them professionals, and some of them NBAs and world champions, so nice sample. Perfect. Nice sample. Excellent, excellent. And what were the main conclusions of uh, the PhD project? The main conclusions? One, one thing uh, I read at the time uh, it was the opinion of the people telling us that basketball was aerobic and aerobic, was something in between, or, or was aerobic with an aerobic peak. So, and what I could corroborate, what I could see in, in, in the trials we did, is that basketball is mostly aerobic, an aerobic sport. Doesn't matter if you move quick, you have recovered, and, but it's an aerobic sport, an aerobic sport, so aerobic. Um, basketball develops also a high, high, high anaerobic threshold, close to the VO2 max. We also check the, um, some um, some algorithms, some formulas that w have been using in uh, in the literature from from other authors, uh, like the Conconis method to to check the the anaerobic threshold. 
with a heart rate that didn't work for us. So it's a conclusion. Also, we check, we test the allometric uh, scales for young players mm -hmm. uh, for the um, for um, use the the body weight, an allometric body weight to the um, VO2 max calculation for the uh, relative VO2 max uh, didn't work neither. So um, this this was in a scientific. Um, in a scientific way, this was a nice conclusion, but didn't help too much. Uh, but the, the main thing for me is that uh, to look at basketball like something anaerobic coming from different, um, different movement, no? from different displacements, different kind of efforts. The, and one thing that amazed me at the moment is that big guys, small guys, middle guys, so centers, uh, forwards, Point guards, they did pretty much the same from a cardiovascular point of view. So some ran, some um, did a lot of slides, some push, some jump more than others, but the cardiovascular result of that was pretty, pretty, pretty much the same. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that was, that was really nice because then we also develop our uh, algorithms to uh, work with just a hurried bell. Uh, with different positions mm -hmm. and and also help us with just that to control the the training even to design different kind of training depending on your role position and to check that you are in the metabolic zones where you have to be mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or where we think you have to be excellent excellent and uh your PhD now, is it available in PDF if people contact you yeah. or it can yeah, be downloaded on internet? It's in PDF, it's uh, in TDX, it's, it's the PDH uh, pages in, in Catalan, mm -hmm. because it's written in Catalan. Uh, it's also in um, Thesis and Thesis and Charcha. Mm -hmm. okay, I will give you the... And if people contact you via email, yeah, is it doesn't okay? matter, doesn't okay. matter. We will share your, your yeah. email one, address. One of the guys that asked for my, <laughs> my PhD document is Luc Le Leger, mm -hmm. who is the, the developer, the inventor of the 20-meter uh, shuttle round, so I'm very proud of, <laughs> of it to honor him with my PhD document. Perfect. Okay, so hopefully more people will be interested and, and contact you. Yeah, yeah, and this is in Catalan, but there's a lot of image and, and graphics that helps to understand mm -hmm. everything, mm -hmm. so... Excellent, excellent. Now, when we are talking about science and PhD, uh, I would like to ask you, uh, how much do you base your everyday work in the gym and on the court on scientific research? And uh, when you read something new, how do you use it in, in, in daily work. Of course, it's not the same if you read paper about, I don't know, P protein versus whey protein, and then you have a guy who is uh, vegan, or you read the latest research on uh, cold water immersion, or you on contrast training. You know, so, but just, just give us some kind of general opinion on how you look at uh, latest scientific research. For me, uh, science right now is my starting point, but is not my truth. So it's my starting point. I always, when I don't know enough about, I always look uh, at, the, at the databases or I even contact some people. I, I try to contact the, the best or those who think, or who I think they are the best in the, in the field to ask them for opinion. Uh, I also uh, attend to uh, conferences and seminars, whatever, online, when there's the ACSM um, in, uh, in uh, the US, there's always uh, the big uh, American College uh, of Sports Medicine conference every year. Uh, I, I stay, uh, wake up uh, at night watching the, <laughs> the conferences because there are hot topics for mm -hmm. us especially about tendons and loads and, um, and I try to, to learn from the, the best people in the field. This is my starting point. Mm -hmm. But then I always, if I can, I try it myself. If done, I try it with the players, but I always take notes. I, I want to check if 
is their truth is my truth also mm -hmm. because you know some of the of the works that have been published um, are not exactly your situation they are not been um, that the research has not been made uh, made with uh, professional basketball players or even with professional sportmen mm -hmm. sometimes are students or even non-active university students i like when it's written university uh, sport university students yeah. and we know that they uh, drink three times a week at least and and sleep habits are like five hours uh, per night if yeah if, they, any, if, if <laughs> they sleep at all so like i always take with caution this like sport yeah. university yeah. student studies and this happens a lot because uh, between high um, high performance athletes and regular people there's a huge difference there's more or less variability sometimes there is room to improve or not it's easy to i, I always state when i do some conferences or when i go i'm professor in, in many uh, masters in catalonia and um, i always talk about statistics or things around statistics that help us to understand the papers because sometimes uh, one thing that freaks me out is that read two papers that say the exactly the, the opposite thing and okay which is the truth no which is the truth and we 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 used to we used to think that the the truth is in the one that we like the most or or that or we do like a, a bias no we trust that one that confirmed our prior belief and and uh, this this approach uh, this scientific approach helps you a lot that to know that and a sportsman is an sportsman and, um, and a regular guy that has been doing a study is something different and that's why I, I, I try to check everything myself and to know as much as I can about the methods methodology for me is, and statistics is one part of it is is the main goal uh, that something something when something is significant or not significant for me is, that means nothing and for me, it starts to mean uh, when something has a high or low effect size, or even when it has clinical importance. If you take a, I know, four or five, the four or five best sprinters in the world, and you improve them, uh, I don't know, two of them, you improve with your training, you improve them uh, 0.05 seconds, you probably made a great job but if you take just four guys probably will not be significant at the end but clinically will be significant to you so you have to be have this kind of knowledge and balance the scientific knowledge and methods to your experience and and, and your field that's why I, I love my coach background also to balance that kind of things that science tell or used to tell us with the, um, our needings on the court or what the coaches or players tell you they come always to needings or or new goals to to accomplish and i think we have to balance them that's that's why i call myself a, a, a basketball strength and conditioning coach and I'm, I'm not just a strength and conditioning coach i'm, I'm probably not good or not as good as i am as, as in basketball in any other sport. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. I like the topic. And now when you said like you really need to understand head coach demands or needs and players needs, I'm just thinking about now like because uh, we are f recording this and now it's 10 o'clock and three hours ago we finished practice and one of the, the guys asked me if the cold tub was ready, like if, if it was on. Uh, and we played game yesterday, last night, and we play tomorrow. And we know by scientific research, if you want to do it uh, to get the greatest benefits, do it after the game. And then in 48 hours, you will be able to perform better. And of course, you're not going to use it today. But if he asks me for that and he wants to do it, and for sure, if he goes inside, uh, his mentality will be changed because he will be sure that he did something for his recovery. I'm not going to go there and try to explain him that he was supposed to go yesterday and 
there is no no point you know so you, you have to understand what is how science helps you to understand things but to put things in practice i mean you you have to understand also the needs of players and i really like uh, that's, I, that's I, one I like of the, the point. point i also like to discuss with colleagues the placebo effect the placebo effect is is amazing because right now in in science is is being discussed because we have always in the clinical trials in the randomized control trials we have the experimental group and the control group with placebo okay but sometimes the placebo group improves improves something and this this not measured and placebo exists and sometimes in our job sometimes players love to do something that is not harmful and you say okay i know it, it has no a physiological effect or a, a neurological effect but take it if if here is good to you the most important thing is that the, it doesn't do any harm that like yeah. if you're 100% sure that there there is going to be a problem then okay explain it avoid it yeah. but if if there is no harm there is no point of like discussing it with especially with players especially one day before the game like you cannot okay sometimes on the road when you're traveling and then maybe you you sit with him take a coffee in Starbucks on the airport and you talk you sometimes somehow guide your conversation so so in in, in direction where you're going to end up talking about this certain topic and then you might be going to explain something because you think it's very important to to deliver it but 24 hours before the game explain the guy how cold water immersion works it's it's too late no, no, you know no, no. it's and 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 moreover you can't change a whole uh, sport life background so you can change maybe a uh, the opinion or of, of a 20 years old guy but you have sometimes experienced players with their own protocols uh, their uh, routines uh, whatever and they will tell you this worked to me i played in many great teams i did my career with I don't know having a bath just before the game or whatever or eating burgers mm -hmm. just before the game and you have to deal with them which is the best way no as you say you have to find the the best way to to help them but sometimes if it's not harm i consider it good yeah I exactly used to exactly it good. exactly uh, currently uh, what is your m main focus when it comes to scientific research where do you spend most time uh, reading watching in everything but right now i have two topics one is um, tendinopathies i i more or less develop like a model to work with because uh, uh, issue for us <laughs> it's a problem every 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 year and it's going to be one of the uh, one of our main topics in the main part yeah. so i'm not going to ask no, anything no, no, no. because no, no. we're going to talk about it and um, the other one uh, probably is uh, is in statistic methods is uh, as we have been talking sometimes uh, uh, how to um, how to study the the player like a single case not like a team performance is you can you maybe say mm, i improve my mm, players ability to jump to run to whatever but you keep losing why you probably you ask yourself why because my uh, the average of my team is better everybody okay because your best five six seven players maybe didn't improve as much as the other mm -hmm. so they are maybe at, they are not at the best so we have to we train we individualize our, uh, your training our training so I, i've seen your <laughs> your board over there uh, the people can see there but there's a white board over there with nice black squares and the names of the players on it we got to take photo I, I, i do pretty much the same is 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 okay you have that workout because you have that needings and and you go your way and you go your way your way your way and we put all together on the court but on strength and conditioning we do everyone does his own way and to assess that is also difficult because you sometimes you have i don't know at the beginning of the season you if you assess jump let's say jump because it's easy um you have a guy that jumps in um 
I don't know, in counter movement, jumps 40 centimeters height. It's okay. And in three months, jumps 41. For you, it's good, it's an improvement. But you have another one that jumps 32 and then jumps 36. Okay, it's four. It's better, it's worse, because his performance is worse, but his improvement is better. So how how you value that? How, which is your opinion about that? Because a number is a number. No? And for me, this kind of methods, and they are not easy to, to find them. Mm -hmm. It's not easy in scientific literature to, to find a single, single method to, to assess, um, in especially in long periods or, or in many trials, uh, the performance of, of the players. Mm -hmm. And this is a problem for me. And I'm Excellent. Can, can, you, can you explain us a little bit? I mean, I have yeah, here yeah, yeah, whiteboard sure, and sure. then we can talk for a little sure, bit about sure. very, very nice. statistics of that's, that, that's small really samples, nice. no? I will show you a couple of things, but let's say we have... Yeah. I can rotate a little bit towards, towards okay. you. I mean. We have here the season. This is the, let's say, the playoff. And here, the preseason. And we start to test one player, let's say we have player A. This is our franchise player, our best player, so we focus on him. And let's say we test counter movement jump. And we did this during the season four times every month. First month we had these results. Okay. Second month, and so on. Boom, boom. And finally, we, we can have this. OK. Which is the value we take from here? Normally, we take one of two. Or the peak, or the which is a flow, or the average, which is another flow. So both of, of them are wrong, <laughs> basically, because if you take the average, then next you expect to have a higher or lower average, a different average, because you did something or maybe you had an injury or whatever. But average is just a value between, you can have the same average with these two and these two. And it's very different. So the average is not good. The peak, okay. You expect this is the best. Let's think about um, sprinter. Okay, we have we make two trials of hundred meters, and we go to the Olympics. But we expect the best. But he runs, and he gets this, and we're upset because of that. Our performance, my 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 answer, my opinion is that our performance is that. It's not that. It's not the average. It's everything. So the whole range. And as yourself, what happened if you don't take four trials, you take just three or two, which will be the result. The average will be different because this doesn't come first, then second, and then all the others. Or if you just do this once, maybe it's that value or that value, and maybe it's one centimeter and a half difference. This happens to me a lot uh, in, in counter movement jump. That is something that basketball players we consider them experienced because they jump. Mm -hmm. No, they are not jumpers, but they jump a lot. And if you test them uh, four times, you probably get a five, seven, eight percent difference between their best and their worst jump. This is easy to find. So there's a huge difference. So for me, you have to trade all of them as ranges, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. range, 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 and then compare that. This is difficult to, ma to make. It's very difficult to make. There's another method. There are methods that consider this the best, and they establish a baseline. And over that, you're improving. Below that, you're overlapped with your baseline range. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if you improve, you're here. If you don't, you're here. We're working on that model in a, in a, 
in the last season uh, results. We, we used to do this kind of test every week. And we're working with that model, with the baseline, but it's not the one that I prefer, but this has been using in, uh, in medicine. Mm -hmm. In medicine, they do, they do like a pre-treatment option with three, four values. You are ill and you get the best. And when you had your treatment, no matter what, you suppose <laughs> <laughs> to improve, <laughs> sometimes don't, but in the long term, you improve. Okay, here you have, let's say, 80% non-overlap data. So you improve 80%. You're likely to improve 80% of the times. Uh -huh. So this is what we, what we need to know, because it's the same as um, in basketball numbers. Uh, there's, a, there's a shooter with, um, in the last second of the, of the game, there's a shooter with, let's say, 25% in three-pointer. Are you going to shoot him alone? Yes or not? Not. The answer is, is easy. You're not going to shoot a guy alone in the last second of a game that is head or tail. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a 25%, okay, it's better that uh, he shoots at a 40% guy. But if he makes it, you're going to, to defend it, to contest the shot, and to down his 25 to 12 or to even, even low. But this is the same. You, you, you can have uh, uh, expectations on average or on uh, maximum values. And it, this is a, a mistake that we used to do in, in sports. And specifically, we used to do when we published papers. We take a set of values, we just disregard to the most of them, and we take the best, or the worst, or the average. And then we don't look to the variability of the guys, we don't look to many, 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 many things. But I, I really like the idea, I really like uh, that someone with great passion for statistics and great passion for the field approaches and talks about these things, because these things in the, in the end are like real work behind uh, uh, evaluating uh, and monitoring uh, players development or uh, player status i mean you can you can we can talk here about counter movement jump but it can, it can be anything that we that we I was, monitor i was thinking about it uh, let's say um, distance covered during the the practices you measure it with uh, our nice indoor gps i just I do the same example eh? yeah. here. You have 10, 12 guys with different values of mirrors cover. Mm -hmm. Okay, in the next practice, you expect, you plan with the coach, okay, let's try to run a little bit more or less because we are close or far from the game. We, have, we need to practice more or less. And you have a different distribution, okay which is just the average, is that guy, that guy. We plan this correctly because that guy is running much more and that guy is much less. So we, we plan it and this is what we want or not. And just this only can be seen uh, individually for me, individually, and in a, like in a time series, like it was a time series analysis, but not, not in that kind of method. But this is really difficult. This is really, really difficult. And for me, it's, that my, it's what I'm struggling right now, just to look at the data and get more from the data, because our data is to have, it doesn't matter if you have a nice um, GPS or nice uh, force platforms or whatever. If you get the data and you don't know how to analyze it, is not get the value from the device from a uh, thousands uh, euros device or whatever sometimes no it's not it's not to get the value the this this is easy that's easy because uh, all all the manufacturers give you a nice software to get uh, uh, many values <laughs> actually a catapult wimo real track whatever they give you many many values, but how how do you get uh, the, the, how do you get the best information from from all the values? 
and especially along the time. Yeah. This, this is for me. I really like the point with distance because now, like we talked about CMJ and and how to evaluate it, and many coaches are using it to to evaluate performance. Some of them not, but when it comes to, for example, distance, which is pretty clear data, and and this is exactly like really good example where you can have like almost the same average, like in in first and yeah. second practice, but if you don't look individually what is happening behind this this average values i mean it's it's obvious that we are making a big mistake you know and i, I really like the point point. and moreover you have individual profiles you have maybe this can be a center and this also center but this guy mm, develops his performance his uh, skills running and jumping more and covering more distance easy like that and these guys is more a low post player slow but it's efficient also but you have to know it and maybe you take more in consideration the meters cover in that guy and maybe the impacts in that guy or maybe the i don't know the maximum strength test with the other guy mm -hmm. this is just to individualize also the the data an analysis in every every one of the, your players perfect perfect Excellent. Do you have something else to add be, uh, about no, statistics? I, have, I, <laughs> I mean, I know that you can <laughs> talk about it for <laughs> days. Be. You are a professor at, uh, at no, many no. master programs about this, but just to... I, I could be talking about this for, for a long time, but, because, but mostly what I have about this is mostly I have questions. I have no answers because okay. nobody, nobody has. Nobody has. It's what the main thing for me, I, I've been in, like researching in statistics for a long time. But in the last two, three years, I'm involved to get something on, on the data from, a, from the uh, samples of one, just one player. I want to analyze every single player. Mm -hmm. And what freaked me out is that you look into the in Google Scholars, Capus, uh, PubMed, whatever you, you look, they are not that kind of uh, analysis. They don't exist. It's simple like that. In, in the pharmaceuticals, they use big samples. And they develop the most of uh, the statistics we use with big samples. Same with psychology. Psychologists are, are great with uh, statistics, but they use big samples. It doesn't matter. If you have, in a group of 10,000, you have 300 that don't improve, don't care. They don't care. <laughs> Yeah. They just demonstrate that they, I don't know, the method, the whatever, it works, and they're going to sell you. Excellent. And, Excellent. and we need to improve every single player. We don't have 12 players to, to coach. We have 12 times one player to coach. This is my opponent for you. Excellent. Excellent. I really like it. I mean, to wrap up the, the first part, basically, uh, I think the, the most, uh, for me, the most valuable point was uh, when you said to be very, very cautious when it comes to uh, reading uh, scientific research and uh, knowing what is behind every scientific research to understand uh, statistical analysis, to understand the population and to look into the methods, not to skip it, like usually people start to read intro, like just to get into, into the paper, then they skip methods and then they go to discussion, which is super, uh, super nice. And then if they don't have mm, enough patience, they, they just skip to practical application, they read it and they say, okay, tomorrow I can, I can use it. But uh, as we said, like one of the most important thing is to, to also, uh, look into every detail of this paper i mean you don't have to read every single word but you need to know where to look at you know where to look at and and, and to know exactly uh, if for you this scientific research uh, will be valuable or not and then as you said like second point that i really liked liked uh, is that you try if if there is a possibility you try to do everything on yourself before uh, you uh, put it into practice with, uh, with your athletes. I mean, I, I really like this point because uh, I think if you really like what you do, you will do everything uh, on yourself. Okay, if as a strength and conditioning guy, 
you had some kind of professional career and you had surgery of your knee or you had problems with your low back. I'm not saying that you have to push yourself to do uh, one RM trap bar deadlift testing with uh, to analyze force velocity uh, profile, but maybe you can you can do it with someone else. Maybe you can do it with with younger athletes or with one player before you implement it with uh, everyone on the team. Uh, but yeah, whatever you can try to do it on yourself in order to get feeling, but not to conclude immediately that if you liked it and it worked for you, that it's gonna work for for everyone else, right? So I really like what we what we talked about in the in the first part. We will take a short break, guys, and we are coming in two minutes.